thank you all for coming this afternoon to this memorial service for William Bateman. On behalf of the friend, family and friends, we welcome you. Uh, it's a time of uh, celebration of life and the giver of life. We're going to open with a prayer and then a hymn. Uh, immortal, invisible, God only wise. And then Linda's going to come and give us a story, a history of her brother William's life. She let me read it. It's just so well written, passionately written. I can't wait to hear it again. And uh, when Linda finishes that, our brother and friend, Mark Kaplan, is going to uh, lead us in some beautiful music that he composes and sings. So the, our service will flow pretty naturally. Let's join our hearts right now in the word of prayer. God, you are the creator of all life. You are great and majestic. There is no one who can create life. You are the governor of life. You are the decider of life and death. You are sovereign king of all things. And today as we remember William's life, we pray that you would uh, make this, this short hour a very deep and rich and meaningful and memorable time for us all. Particularly Linda, as she recalls her brother's life. We trust your goodness. Commit this time to your care and your glory. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, underneath the chair in front of you, there's a great book. You turn to page 25. It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn. And if you just stand with me and uh, we'll sing this great hymn. Uh, with this great request, number 25. We were very different in many ways. 
I was shy and studious, always reading or trying to play someone's piano before we had one of our own. William was very friendly and outgoing, had lots of friends, and created a whirlwind in any room he entered. But he often had a hard time in school. He was creative in ways that no one could predict, which often led to interesting situations. Life was never boring with William. And I have a few examples of this. Uh, one time in junior churches, the collection plate was going around. Everyone would put their money into the plate except for William. He would make a withdrawal. <laughs> this must have happened several times before the powers that be finally had to tell my parents. And my mother searched high and low for the money, finally finding over $42 in change behind his dresser. And this was like the 1960s, so that was a bit of money. Another time, my mother and William were at the doctor's office, and the doctor wanted to talk to my mother privately. So there were two receptionists there that were sure they could take care of this little kid, this cute little kid, for five minutes without a problem. But by the time my mother came out, the girls were in a frenzy. William had taken the keys to the file cabinets and locked the cabinets with the keys inside with all the patient files. I never heard how they ever got them open again. The last example I will never forget because it involves me. I was 14 and William was 11, and it was the dog days of August. 90 degrees with no wind blowing, no other humans around. Everyone was in air-conditioned homes. Our car had died on us and was sitting in the driveway waiting for someone to come and tow it away. My mother had a dentist appointment, and someone from church was taking her to it, and in her absence, we were each assigned tasks to do. Mine were housework related, and William's task was to clean out the car, look for loose change, and take everything necessary out of the trunk. Now, 10 minutes after my mother left, I had to stop what I was doing, because William would call me for some silly reason or other, and I would check it out and find out it 